they have to have some uh, good karma. And we, we rarely see people with less than five or six Raja Yogas in their chart, you know, which gives them the ability to live in a developed country, Western country, and have, you know, the normal, what we consider the normal facilities of life. But um, actually, these things are coming regardless of whether they work or they don't work. This is something that materialistic people find very difficult to understand, that your karma is coming to you whether you work for it or you don't. See? As long as you have some means to accept the results of your previous activities, then you're going to, you're going to get them. Uh -huh whether you have a job or you don't have a job or whatever your situation is. It, it doesn't require money. Huh? The money is an artificial invention of the Western corporate society. You do not need money. Yeah, you, what you need is food, shelter, clothing, uh, association, like that. Huh? But these things are coming from your karma. That was born along with you. When you took this birth, you also inherited so much results of activities from your previous lifetime. And these things are coming to you. Whether they come through money or they come in other ways, it doesn't matter. When I was in India, I lived in temples. Huh? So I was always living in a marble palace. <laughs> I had plenty of food to eat. Huh? Sometimes we had too much food to eat. So too much prasadam. Uh, all these things were coming. And was I working? Well, no, I was doing devotional service, yeah. Yeah. I was under the protection of my spiritual master. So, you know, if I had been living outside the temple and working in a job, I would have had the same facilities. I would have lived in a nice place. I would have had nice food and so on like that. All my needs would have been take, taken care of. But the difference is, if I'm working in business outside the temple, then everything I do is generating karma for my next birth. It's not that we get the results of our karma in this life so much, May, maybe a little, uh, but most of the results from our karma is in the next life. Similarly, we get the results of our previous life's activities in this life. So people say, well, I can't just do devotional service. I have to work for a living and do all this stuff. No, you don't. You don't. If you just stop working for a living and start preaching, you'll see Krishna will take care of you. Huh? That's our experience. That's what we're doing. And it's working. And there's a, a unlimited room for expansion of those activities. Huh? There are what? How many billion people in the world now? Seven billion people or something like that? Some ridiculous, absurd number. How many of them are devotees or how many of them are engaged in, in some uh, uh, bhakti association? Just a mere handful. Just a few thousand. Huh? Probably most of them are in India too. So there's an unlimited scope all over the world for propagating this philosophy. And this philosophy can defeat any other philosophy. Uh, so there's an unlimited scope for preaching. Uh, we've built up this preaching mission from nothing over the last five or six years. And yeah, there are challenges. You have to be fixed up. You have to be advanced. You have to have knowledge. You have to know the scriptures. Uh, you have to have studied and learned and contemplated the meaning of all these shastras. Uh, you have to be able to put them into practice in your own life and preach from your own experience and your own realization. But I mean, really, is there anything other, other uh, to do? Is there any other meaningful engagement in this world other than teaching the means to get out of the material existence altogether? Huh? I mean, is there really any other thing that's more important to do? Hmm? Just to put food in your mouth, that's easy. Anybody can do that. Huh? Everybody does that. They work and they somehow or other get food. Isn't it? So it's very easy to preach Krishna consciousness and get the, uh, 
the minimal uh, necessities of life from that preaching work. It's very easy. And if you apply yourself and use a little bit of intelligence and you manage things nicely, then you can have much more than just the uh, basics or the necessities. Uh, you can have a very nice situation. So try to understand this process of Krishna consciousness, this esoteric teaching is so wonderful. It's so powerful. Uh, the knowledge is so grand. It's, it's so high. Uh, it's, it's knowledge of consciousness and the world of consciousness. See, knowledge of consciousness is actually much more extensive than knowledge of the material world. Because everybody's consciousness is a platform for unlimited, beautiful pastimes, the exchange of love between the soul and the Supreme Lord. Try to understand. Within you, there is a whole eternal world of possibilities that you can access and you can explore through this process of Krishna consciousness. The external world is limited. It's limited in time. It was created at a certain time, exists for a certain amount of time, and then is destroyed at a particular time. Uh, so it's limited by time. It's also limited by space. We are pretty much limited to this thin little bubble of an atmosphere around the planet Earth. We can't go down into the Earth. We can't go down into the sea. And we can't go higher than a certain altitude, uh, or we can't breathe. So we're pretty much stuck in this little bubble. Huh? So we're limited by space. And our lives are also very limited in time, just 100 years at the most. Huh? In this material world, everything is limited. Everything is finite. Everything has boundaries. But the inner world is not limited. Uh, there are unlimited possibilities in the inner world. You can go into meditation, then you can just, well, you could do anything you want. <laughs> and you can do it with Krishna, who is the perfect friend. Uh, why should you be limited by the social possibilities and the emotional possibilities and the relationship possibilities of this ordinary physical world when you can have an eternal relationship with Krishna that's completely unconditional? Unconditional means it's unlimited. It's not bounded. It's infinite. It has unlimited possibilities. It's like an ocean, an ocean without any shore, without any bottom. Uh, and you can just get lost in that ocean and, and never come back. Uh, and those who attain that spiritual world, they, they never do come back. That's what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. Those who go there never come back to this material world. Well, why would you want to? Uh, this material world is limited in every way. Uh, so the body, even the body of a pure devotee, is going to have so many defects. Huh? You may, we may not look you know, so handsome, or we may not have so many uh, qualities that are normally considered desirable or whatever. Actually, this is our good fortune. <laughs> it means that people aren't going to be interested in exploiting us. Huh? So uh, that's the situation of most people. And that's all right. You can still become spiritually advanced. No material qualification necessary. Simply chant the holy name of the Lord. Uh, do devotional service. Understand this teaching. Help to spread it around the world. And you can have a wonderful life of, of spiritual enlightenment and bliss. Yeah, this is open to everybody. Of any age, of any country, of any level of education, of any uh, physical uh, qualification. Huh? You don't have to be beautiful, rich, famous, or any of that stuff. A little intelligence helps. <laughs> but even quite ordinary, simple people can understand. If you just love Krishna, then Krishna responds. You know, this, is, this is not rocket science. It's love. It's love. The problem is, 
in the West especially, most of us have been socialized out of the ability to love. And we have been socialized also into a state of compulsive extroversion, where we are constantly looking out through the senses. And in that kind of consciousness, you cannot approach Krishna. Uh, so we have to change our consciousness and revive our original internal spiritual consciousness. Then we can approach Krishna. Uh, and everybody wants somebody to love, so why not love the most perfect person? Uh, the most beautiful, the most rich. Uh, and he loves everybody perfectly, eternally, unconditionally. I don't know why anybody would want to try to love somebody else when they can love Krishna. You know, this world, the relationships are always full of problems. Well, why not have a relationship where there aren't any problems? 